It's all you now, Bill. Go right ahead. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone who uh, is joining. I hope that this will be helpful for you as you think about uh, your college options for um, your students. So <clears throat> we're gonna go over quite a bit of material in the presentation today. And um, there are a few fundamental takeaways that I'm hoping that everyone will get. Uh, I also want to let you know that I'll be putting my email address up at the end of the presentation. And if anyone would like a copy of the slides, feel free to <clears throat> email me and I'll be happy to send them to you. So in terms of the takeaways, one of the really important ones is when you are thinking about financial aid, what really matters is gift aid. That's grants and scholarships, and we'll talk about that in detail. Another thing to keep in mind is that almost all gift aid comes directly from colleges. <clears throat> so many people think uh, that their student will be admitted to a college, and then they'll go and seek out scholarships from outside sources. That's actually um, a very dangerous approach because the majority of aid comes from colleges and those outside scholarships typically don't add up to enough to make a significant difference in the cost. You always wanna focus on the true cost of college, which is called the net price. That's the starting price minus the gift aid. And how much gift aid your student is going to get depends on a couple of factors. And really it's important to match the student's profile in terms of the student's eligibility for need-based aid or academic scholarships and how the college awards aid. So if your student has high need, but you're looking at a college that doesn't have a lot of need-based aid, that's not going to be a good outcome. Similarly, if you need money to pay for college, but you don't have high financial need, then you probably want to look at colleges that award on the basis of academics as a way to have some additional cost options when you're deciding where your student will go. Key point is that making some decisions about this list of schools that the student is going to apply to makes a huge difference because unless, you unless your student applies to affordable colleges in the fall, having affordable choices in the spring of senior year is going to be a matter of luck. And finally, affordability is different for everyone based on the student's net price and the resources that you have you as a, as a family have available to pay the net price. So we'll talk about all of these points as we go through the presentation. The overall agenda that I wanna to cover today is assessing where you might get aid. And in this case, you means the student, and then deciding what you can afford. And in this case, you probably means the parents in addition to the student. Where you might get aid is a matter of identifying the student's profile in terms of eligibility for need-based aid. That's typically based on family income and assets. All combined, that will <clears throat> determine the student's EFC and then how the college meets financial need will determine the eventual price. GPA test scores in class rank go into uh, merit factors. <clears throat> and being a strong applicant compared to other applicants is going to be important in getting merit aid or the maximum merit aid. Also, making sure that the college awards merit aid in its awarding approach. Deciding what you can afford is making sure that you're clear on the true total cost of college. That's the net price of a degree understanding the resources you have to pay the cost. Typically that's going to be savings and money that you can pay out of income. If those resources aren't enough, thinking about how much you're going to have to borrow and critically making sure that any amount that you borrow is going to be reasonable. 
So we'll cover those items in detail. So we said that the net price is the true cost of college. Now, when most people think about the cost of college, they tend to focus on the sticker price or the starting cost. At Binghamton, that's 28,000. At Wheaton in Massachusetts, it's about 71. Connecticut College is 75 and NYU is 76. But it turns out that colleges have a, quite a bit of gift aid that they award under certain circumstances. And so after gift aid, the net price to aided students is about 19,000 at Binghamton, 29,000 at Wheaton, 40,000 at Connecticut College, and 45,000 at NYU. There's another complication though. Not all students receive gift aid. So at Binghamton and NYU, only a little more than half of the students get gift aid. At Wheaton and Connecticut, almost all students get gift aid. So when you factor in the percent of students who actually receive aid, the true net price for all students ranges from about 23,000 at Binghamton, 29,000 at Wheaton, 41,000 at Connecticut College and 58,000 at NYU. So the, the thing I want you to remember from this is it doesn't matter what colleges charge and don't be confused by clickbait that says these are the best value colleges. What matters is what you pay and what you pay is going to be your net price, the college's cost of attendance or starting cost minus the gift aid that your student might receive. So there are two main categories of financial aid. <clears throat> One of them we've talked about a little bit already is gift aid. This is free money that reduces the cost of college. Typically, if it's based on financial need, it's called grants. If it's based on academic factors, uh, it's called merit aid or scholarships. Now those are Kind of guidelines, it's not always the case, but typically those are the terms that you'll see used. The other category of financial aid is self-help, and this is financial aid that does not reduce the cost of college, but it helps you to manage it. So there are two types of self-help. One is work-study, a campus job that the student gets during college, and then loans, money that you borrow to pay the cost of college, but it has to be repaid with interest after college is done. So when you look at it this way, it's pretty clear that gift aid is much more important than self-help, and that's what you really want to focus on. However, colleges don't necessarily make it easy for you to uh, distinguish between different types of financial aid. So here's a an award letter, and unfortunately, this one is pretty typical of what you're going to see. Award letters are the ways that colleges advise you of how much financial aid your student is going to get. So if you look at this award letter, it says the total award is $22,000. Well, that's a lot of money, that's great. But when you look at it a little bit more closely, it turns out that out of the seven line items on this award letter, Four of them are gift aid, two of them are loans, and one is work study. So when you separate those out by categories and look at what the subtotals are, it turns out that the gift aid is about $15,000, loans are $5,500, and work study is about $1,800. Now, $15,000 is still a lot of money, but it's not nearly as much as $22,000, clearly. And there's some important information missing. That includes the starting cost or the list price and your true cost, the net price after gift aid. So I went online in this case and I looked up what the starting cost was. And it turns out that the starting cost at this college was a little under $50,000 a year. When you subtract 15,000 in gift aid, that means that the net price for this student for one year of college is $34,865. Now keep that uh, amount in mind. We're gonna come back to it at the end of the presentation, 
But first, let's go into a little bit more detail about the types of uh, gift aid. And uh, if I can just ask for everyone to please mute yourself, that will uh, enhance the sound quality for everyone. So please take a moment now and make sure that your uh, microphone is on mute because I can hear some uh, background noise. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about the uh, two types of gift aid. One of them is need-based aid, which is typically called grants, and that's based on family income and assets. You apply for gift aid at all U.S. colleges using the FAFSA form. And the FAFSA is also required for federal loans at all U.S. colleges. In addition to the FAFSA, there is an additional financial aid application that's required for college-funded gift aid at about 150 colleges. Now, there are over 2,000 four-year colleges in the United States, so it's a minority that require the CSS profile but they tend to be the colleges that are the most well-known and they tend to be the ones that are most generous with gift aid. So there's a good chance that as your student is going through the college application process, you will encounter the CSS profile. <clears throat> the other type of gift aid is merit aid, which is typically called scholarships. And this is usually based on things like grades, test scores, class rank, the a uh, number of high uh, level courses that a student has taken in high school and so on. Merit scholarships are often awarded automatically. So when the college advises your student, hey, you've been admitted to our college, they'll often say, and you are gonna qualify for a scholarship of X amount per year. However, at some colleges, there are some types of uh, scholarships that do require additional applications. So you always wanna check the college's financial aid website to make sure you understand how to apply for and qualify for the maximum amount of gift aid. Whether it's need-based aid or merit aid, you always wanna set yourself up to get the maximum amount. So let's start out by talking about need-based aid, which we said is typically called grants. Here's the algebra portion of the presentation. Need equals COA minus EFC. I'll explain those terms in a minute, but the key thing to remember is that need is defined as your potential eligibility for need-based aid. It's not necessarily the amount of aid that your student is going to receive. So COA stands for cost of attendance, and that's always made up of four elements, tuition and fees, room and board, books and supplies, and transportation and other miscellaneous expenses. You add all four of those together, and that's the total sticker price or starting cost of each college. EFC stands for expected family contribution. And this is one of the most misleading terms in the English language, because if you read it in English, it makes you think that this is what you're going to be expected to pay for college. In reality, people rarely pay the amount of their EFC. They may pay more, they may pay less, but EFC really is nothing more than an index. It's a way of ranking all of the students who are applying to college in order of the economic resources that the student and their family have that might help to pay for college. A key point of need-based aid is that college aid policies vary. Some colleges award little or no need-based aid, other colleges meet full financial need based on the FAFSA or the profile EFC. So it's very important when you're thinking about where you might get aid to understand what your student's profile is and how the college meets, uh, awards its financial aid. Now, if you want to estimate your EFC, you can go to this website. And remember, at the end of the presentation, I'll be showing my email address. Feel free to email me afterwards, and I'll email these slides to uh, anyone who asks. 
If you estimate your EFC on this website, it's going to be helpful, but it's not sufficient. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say that you estimate your EFC and it turns out that it's 30,000. Well, that tells you as a New York resident that you will qualify for zero need-based aid at Binghamton because Binghamton's starting cost is less than that 30,000 EFC. On the other hand, at NYU, which is about 75,000, you might qualify for as much as 45,000 in need-based aid. It doesn't mean that that's how much you'll get. And in fact, at NYU, you probably won't get anything near 45,000, but that's the maximum amount of need-based aid that you could get. Another thing to keep in mind is that each college defines its idea of need, and that idea of need is rarely the same as the families. So we said that EFC determines eligibility for need-based aid. A lower EFC means greater eligibility for need-based aid. So all of the things being equal, you'd rather have a lower EFC if you want to get more need-based aid. Now, there are two EFC formulas, one based on the FAFSA and one based on the profile, but they both take the same basic approach, which is to look at the income and assets of the parents and the student. So there are actually four separate calculations going on in the background. The results of each of those four calculations is added up, and the total becomes the student's EFC. A couple of things to point out. In most cases, income plays a much bigger role in the EFC than assets do. And so I often hear people say, oh, my assets are going to kill me for financial aid. Well, in some cases that's true, but once you reach a certain minimum threshold of income, every additional dollar of income is going to add about 50 cents to the EFC. Once you reach a certain minimum level of assets, every additional dollar of assets is going to add a nickel or six cents to the EFC. So you can see that income is a far more significant factor for um, eligibility for aid than assets are for most people. And most people are not in a position to quit their job for four years during college to uh, increase their eligibility for aid. So, once your student is, a, is in high school, the opportunities to influence the EFC tend to be pretty limited. Another thing I want to point out is that if the student happens to have assets in his or her name, that's going to count more against the EFC than assets in the parent's name. If a student happens to have $10,000 in assets, that's going to add $2,000 to $2,500 to the EFC. If those assets were in the parent's name, it would add about $500 to the EFC. So having assets in the parent's name is advantageous compared to having them in the student's name. It turns out that there's a loophole if your student happens to have assets in his or her name. And this loophole, unlike many, is available to pretty much anyone. So if your student has assets in their name, you can liquidate those assets and put them into a student-owned 529 account. 529 accounts have special treatment in the EFC formula, and even if they're owned by the student, they are counted as if they were a parent asset at that lower rate. Now, if you're thinking about doing this, keep in mind that there may be tax consequences from uh, liquidating those assets. So you always want to think about the overall financial picture, but thinking strictly about the EFC, that could be something that you might want to think about. There are a few special cases in determining the EFC that uh, I want to highlight. One of them is if you have multiple siblings in college at the same time, the parent portion of the EFC is shared among those siblings. So having multiple siblings in college at the same time means that the EFC for each one is likely to be significantly lower 
than if you had those students going to college sequentially. Now, this is going to be changing uh, for the FAFSA, not necessarily for the profile. And I'll talk about that a bit more in, in a moment. Another thing to keep in mind is that when you fill out the FAFSA and the CSS profile, you're reporting income that was earned in the past. And in some cases, after the period in which you're reporting the income, your financial circum cir circumstances might have changed. Perhaps there was a job loss. Perhaps there were unexpected uh, medical expenses, divorce, death, or disability. In those cases, you need to report the information as it actually occurred, but then you want to contact each college that your student is applying to and say, hey, my circumstances have changed since the year that, was, uh, that I filled out uh, the information for on the FAFSA and the profile, can you consider me for additional aid? The other special case I wanna highlight is when the parents are divorced or separated. And here, the way the FAFSA treats them is quite different from the way the profile treats them. So let's talk about the FAFSA first. The FAFSA is going to look at the custodial parent only. And if that parent has remarried, they will look at the new spouse as well. The profile is going to look at both biological parents, the custodial and the non-custodial parent. And if those parents have remarried, they will also look at the new spouses. So <clears throat> with the profile, they may be looking at the income and assets of as many as four different parents. Uh, now, there are some calculations that are going on in the background that are intended to put the primary burden for college on the biological parents, but those calculations are imperfect, and it can often be disadvantageous uh, if parents remarry while their kids are going to college and they're filling out financial aid forms. So we said that the FAFSA and the profile are looking at income that was earned in the past. And I wanna show you an example of the timing for a current high school junior. A high school junior now is going to be graduating in the high school class of 2023. And assuming that they start college in the fall of 2023, then the year, the income that's being asked about on the FAFSA and the profile is going to be 2021 the year that ended just a couple of months ago. Now you're probably in the process of getting your taxes ready. They're going to be filed by April 15th. Your student will be applying for college this fall, the fall of 2022, and you'll file the FAFSA in the CSS profile in the fall of 2022. In that way, when colleges advise your student of whether they've been admitted in the spring of 2023, they'll also be able to let you know of any financial aid that you might be able to get. So that's how income is reported. That's the timing of the income on the FAFSA and the profile. Assets are valued as of the date that you submit the form electronically. Almost everyone submits these forms uh, online. And what that means is that assets are going to be valued in the fall of 2022 for most students who are gonna be graduating from high school in the class of 2023. This potentially gives you some planning opportunities. We said that assets in general have less impact on the EFC than income does, that's true. But if you can get some assets off the table, it could be advantageous. So you don't want to spend money foolishly, obviously, but if, for example, you have expenses that you know you need to make toward the end of 2022, you may want to make those expenses or to pay those expenses a little bit earlier so that they're not on your books at the time that you file the FAFSA and the profile. And a common example of that might be estimated taxes. If you pay estimated taxes, your due date might be early January, 2023. Well, if you file them a little bit earlier before you file the FAFSA and the profile, 
they won't be uh, in your bank account and therefore won't be counted uh, as assets in the financial aid formulas. So here's a table that shows you the uh, years that will be looked at for juniors for each of the four years of college. For the first year of college, we said they're gonna look at 2021. Second year will be 2022, third year is 2023, and the fourth year is 2024. Now this gives you another potential uh, planning tip. If a student is fortunate enough to have a grandparent who is going to help pay college expenses, those grandparent payments may be counted as untaxed income toward the student and therefore have some impact on eligibility for need-based aid. But it turns out that the last year that's being looked at for this student's senior year of college is the year that ends when this student is a sophomore in college. So if the grandparents wait until after January 1st of the student's sophomore year to make those payments, it will know it that final income year for the FAFSA and the profile will have passed and it won't have any impact on eligibility for aid. Now remember, this is a factor only if the student is likely to qualify for need-based aid. If the student's not going to qualify for need-based aid, the timing of those grandparent payments uh, won't matter at all. This is another area where the FAFSA rules are going to be changing. I'll talk about that in just a minute. I've got some uh, uh, tables here that show you the years that will be looked at if your student is in 10th grade now and also in 9th grade. So if you request the slides, uh, you can get these tables. Now, I mentioned that the FAFSA is changing, and a really important point is will the profile be changing its rules as well? So let's talk about that. The FAFSA is going to be changing effective for the 2024-2025 academic year. That means that juniors in the high school class of 2023 are going to have one year using the old FAFSA and three years using the new FAFSA rules. When the new rules go into effect, most income items are going to be imported directly from the IRS. Now some income items are. After this uh, change, most of them will. And this is going to make filing the FAFSA much easier. Also, that term that I dislike so much, EFC, is going to become the student aid index. It's going to function exactly the same way but at least the terminology will not be quite as misleading. If the parents are divorced, the custodial parent for FAFSA purposes will be changing. So right now under the current FAFSA rules, the custodial parent is the parent with whom the student lives most of the time, more than 50% of the time. Beginning in 2023, 24, 25, the custodial parent is going to become the parent who contributes more than 50% of the support for that student, 50% of the financial support. Now in many and perhaps most cases, that's still going to be the custodial parent, but it may not always be the case. <clears throat> Another thing for the, chat, for the FAFSA is that payments by relatives that grandparent payment that we were talking about a moment ago will no longer count as student income for the FAFSA. But before you get too excited about that, I think that's not going to be the case for the profile. And I'll talk about that in a second. Finally, that discount when there are multiple siblings in college simultaneously is being eliminated for the FAFSA. <coughs> So what's going to be the impact of these FAFSA changes? Well, very needy students will benefit. It's going to be a big advantage if students are very high need. It's not going to be quite so clear for uh, students in middle income families. And a crucial question is what's going to happen to the CSS profile? The reason that's so important is because the most generous need-based aid 
comes from colleges that use the CSS profile. At these colleges, the maximum annual aid based on the FAFSA is about seven to $10,000, depending on what state you live in. The maximum aid based on the profile could be as much as $70,000 per year. And another reason it's very important is because colleges that don't use the profile often don't meet full financial need. They gap their students, which means that there's a gap between the uh, amount of financial need that the student has and the amount of aid that the college offers. So we said that uh, an important point is how the CSS profile reacts. And this is my educated judgment as to what the profile is going to do in response to some of the significant changes. I think that for the custodial parent, the profile is going to conform to the new FAFSA rules to consider the parent with whom the student lives, I'm sorry, the parent who provides more than 50% of the student support. Now that's really not gonna make much difference in practice because almost all profile colleges require information from both the custodial and non-custodial parent anyway. I think that profile colleges are very likely to continue to count payments by relatives such as grandparents as untaxed income to the student. So I think that this is going to be a case where the profile will not change its rules to conform to the FAFSA. And I think that whether the profile colleges continue to offer a reduction in the EFC when there are multiple siblings in college at the same time could go either way, but I think that there's a good chance that profile colleges will continue to discount the uh, the EFC for those students. So the bottom line here is really the same bottom line as it always has been. Don't necessarily make drastic changes to your overall financial picture in order to qualify for more financial aid, unless they also make sense in terms of your overall financial planning. So what we've talked about so far is identifying the student's eligibility for need-based aid that's defining that student's profile. Now we want to see if the student has need, how can we identify colleges that might meet that need? So what I want to show you are some pie charts about how colleges uh, treat financial need. Now remember, the need is only a portion of the total cost of college. You take the EFC, add the need to it, and then uh, that's the total cost of college. So when we're talking about these statistics, don't confuse them for the total cost. Remember that we're only talking about the student's financial need. So on average at Binghamton, the um, uh, student's need is met about almost half with gift aid. About 27% of the need is not met, so there's a gap. Now, Binghamton is usually going to be affordable for New York residents, but that's not because they've got a particularly generous need-based aid program. It's because the starting cost is lower. At uh, the University of Maryland, they gap about 38%, and they meet about 39% of need with gift aid. So if you're not a resident of Maryland, that's probably not going to be a great place for you to go if you have high financial need. Looking at a couple of other colleges at NYU, they gap about 38%. They meet about half of financial need with gift aid. At Ohio Wesleyan, their gap is 16%. They meet almost three quarters of need with gift aid. And at BU and Colby, they have pretty generous need-based aid programs. And Colby is an example of kind of the gold standard of colleges that meet financial need. They meet full financial need, so there's no gap between the amount of need that a student has and the amount of the aid that the college awards. And they meet 
almost all of that need, 97%, with gift aid. So Colby is a particularly generous college when it comes to awarding need-based aid. So let's say that you run your EFC and you, you find that you do have some financial need. Will need-based aid make a given college affordable? So I want to show you an example of a very generous college that meets full financial need. The cost of attendance at this college is $72,000 a year, and the EFC in this example is $30,000. So when you subtract the EFC from the cost, there's $42,000 of financial need. The college is going to meet that $42,000 of need with financial aid. But the first $4,500 is going to be met with a loan. The next $2,000 is going to be met with work-study, and only after the college awards loans and work study will it meet any remaining need with gift aid. So in this example, that's about $35,000. When you subtract the amount of gift aid from the starting cost, that means that the net price for the first year of this college is about $37,000. That's about $7,000 more than the EFC. If you look at years two, three, and four, this pattern continues. And when you add everything up at the end of four years of college, there's been $168,000 of need, and that need has been fully met by loans, work study, and gift aid. The gift aid is about $135,000. You subtract that from the total cost, and the net price of $153,000 is about $33,000 more than the total combined EFC over those four years. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind. Remember, this is a very generous college, and this example doesn't include inflation. So the rule of thumb is that if your EFC times four plus about $40,000 isn't affordable, then need-based aid may not be the answer to finding an affordable college for your student. All right, so if need-based aid won't make college affordable, what other avenue do you have? You might want to consider merit aid. And to think about merit aid, we first need to talk a little bit about the business of college because in the in the end, in the bottom line, colleges operate much as a business, even if they are nonprofit. Now, when students and parents think about colleges, they tend to focus on the acceptance rate. That's the percent of the applicants to a college who are offered admission at that college. At Harvard, it's about 5%. At Northeastern and BU, it's about 20%. And at Ohio Wesleyan and Susquehanna, it's 70%, give or take a bit. Now, colleges obviously focus on the acceptance rate, but they also look at another number, which is the yield rate. That's the percent of students who were offered admission to a given college who end up enrolling at that college in the fall. At Harvard, seven out of 10 students who were admitted to Harvard end up going to Harvard. At Northeastern and BU, it's about a quarter. And at Ohio Wesleyan and Susquehanna, it's more like 15%. Now, when that yield rate gets into the 20s and lower, colleges really worry about whether they're going to have enough students enrolled at their college and making tuition payments to help them pay the bills. So what do they do? They discount their prices with financial aid in order to compete for yield. So the third column here shows the percent of students receiving some type of college-funded gift aid at a given college. It could be need-based aid or it could be merit-based aid, but that's the percent of students receiving college-funded aid. At Harvard, 57% of students receive some type of college-funded gift aid. That means that 43% of students at Harvard are paying the full price, 
And if you look at the fourth column, there's zero non-need aid at Harvard. That means that Harvard uses only need-based aid when it's awarding its financial aid. It uses no merit aid. At uh, Ohio Wesleyan in Susquehanna, on the other hand, they give uh, some type of gift aid to almost all of their students and a significant portion of it, 20 to 30%, is merit aid. So they do have some need-based aid, but they're also offering significant amounts of merit aid in order to attract students to their college who might otherwise go to another college if they didn't have this attractive price discount. So that's the overview of how merit aid works. Let's talk about it in some more detail. So we said that the factors that go into it are GPA, class rank, test scores, academic rigor of the curriculum that the student has taken in high school. Merit aid is most prevalent at private colleges, but more and more public colleges are using it now too. And a key point, the highest merit award goes to the strongest students compared to the other applicants at that college which means that your student is likely to get the highest merit offers at colleges that you might consider their safety schools. So a safety school for admission may also be a safety school for financial aid. And as with need-based aid, college aid policies vary. Some colleges use no merit aid. Other colleges use a significant amount of merit aid. So let's look at some specific examples. And I wanna show you Gettysburg in Pennsylvania and a couple of Florida colleges. And when you look at the highest uh, merit award at Gettysburg, it's about $32,000 a year. And that goes to students with a 3.8 GPA and a 1450 on their SATs. And if you take a look at their uh, overall student body profile, it turns out that the 75th percentile SAT score at Gettysburg is 1410. What that means is that 25% of the students at Gettysburg scored higher than 1410 on their SATs. And that highest merit award is set for students who are a little bit above that 75th percentile. And you can see that at Tampa and Eckerd, though their highest merit awards are also pretty closely linked to the 75th percentile of the SAT scores for their students. The lower merit awards are also not that far off from the 25th percentile. So for example, a lower merit award at Gettysburg of about 24,000 a year goes to students with a 1300 SAT, that's just a little bit above the 1280 that represents the 25th percentile at Gettysburg. The SAT score scored that 25% that of their students scored lower than 1280 uh, at Gettysburg. So it turns out that these patterns are pretty consistent among colleges. And you can make a generalization from that. And here it is. If a college uses merit aid, the best chances for large awards are when the student is near or above the college's 75th percentile. If a college uses merit aid, the awards may phase out when you're at about the 25th percentile. But at colleges that compete aggressively for students, they may award merit aid to just about all of their students. So let's say that you're looking to try to find colleges that might award merit aid. What types of things can you look for? Well, that percent of students receiving college-funded gift aid is a pretty telling statistic. At Gettysburg, it's 89%. And at Washington College in Maryland, it's 99%. So when that percent of students receiving college-funded gift aid is over 65 to 70 percent, it's likely that the college uses merit aid as part of its aid awarding approach. If it's over 80 percent, 
it's highly likely that the college uses merit aid. So let's say that you're looking at your student and you want to identify some specific colleges that your student might apply to where he or she might get merit aid. I'm going to show you an example of a student whose SAT is about 1150. That's equivalent to an ACT of 23. And US News has tables that show you the 75th and 25th percentiles. So at Shenandoah University in Virginia, their 75th percentile SAT score is 1123. That's lower than this student's 1150 SAT, meaning that this student is likely to qualify for one of the highest awards at Shenandoah. And if you look at some other colleges, you can see that Suffolk in Boston, Old Dominion in uh, Virginia, and UMass Dartmouth also have uh, SATs where the 75th percentile is lower than this student's 1150. And even if the uh, 75th percentile isn't lower, but it's pretty close, the student might not get the absolute maximum award, but he's, he or she might still get a pretty good merit award at places like Pace or Leslie or New Mexico State University. Another place you can look for information about merit aid is a, a source of data called the Common Data Set. Most colleges fill in the Common Data Set. It's got all kinds of statistics on those colleges, and most of them make it available. So if you Google the college name that you're looking for and then the words Common Data Set, you can usually find it. And once you do, you want to identify data elements H, 2, A, N, and O. N is the number of students who started at that college with no financial need and were, and were awarded college-funded non-need uh, gift aid at that college. This happens to be Hofstra uh, on Long Island and 372 students or about a quarter of the incoming students at Hofstra got some type of merit aid. And the average amount was about 24,000. So let's look at some merit aid examples. So I want to show you uh, some examples of some uh, private colleges first. So at Trinity College in um, Connecticut, about 4% of the students received merit aid. So if you're looking for merit aid, Trinity is probably not going to be a great candidate. On the other hand, McAllister and Dickinson award merit aid to about almost 20% of their students. Fordham and the College of Worcester in Ohio are closer to 25% of the students. And you can see that the average award ranges from 20,000 at several of these schools to over 30,000 at the College of Worcester. At a few public colleges, at UC Berkeley, 5% of the students received uh, merit aid. So UC Berkeley is not going to be a good candidate for merit aid. And actually, if you're not from California, I'll tell you that UC Berkeley is not going to be a good candidate for need-based aid either. So if your student is applying to Berkeley, you better be prepared to pay the full price. At the University of Maryland and URI, they offer uh, merit aid to 16 to 22% of students. At Arizona State and the University of Maine, they offer it to over 30% of students. So those are some colleges where your student is likelier to get uh, some strong merit awards if your student is strong compared to the other applicants at those schools. So the rule of thumb is the best chance for merit aid are when colleges have relatively high admit rates, relatively low yield rates, and a relatively high percent of students who receive college-funded gift aid, and the applicant is strong relative to other students. So 
I want to show you a summary of how colleges award need and merit-based aid. And I've broken down colleges into four categories. I call them the elite, the near elite, the mid-market, and the other. The elite and the near elite are colleges that are very well known and famous. Stanford, Amherst, Colby, Carleton. These colleges have very strong need-based aid programs. They meet full need, and nearly all of it they meet with gift aid. On the other hand, they use very little or no merit aid. On the other hand, mid-market and other colleges tend not to have as strong a need-based program, and often they will leave a gap. So high-need students may not fare as well at these schools, but <clears throat> they do use a significant amount of merit aid. It turns out that there are maybe 100 or 125 colleges that you might put in those elite or near elite categories with the great need-based aid. There are over 2,000 colleges that are in the mid-market and other category <clears throat> who are very eager to attract your students and in many cases are willing to offer merit aid to those students. All right, so we've talked about need-based aid and merit-based aid. Let's talk about how to estimate your cost for a, co for a college. Uh, Remember, Bill, Bill, before you go on, is there a way you could um, answer a couple questions? Uh, yes. Or you want to do uh, it after? Why don't we do questions after? Because often uh, some of the questions get answered over the course of the program, if that's okay. all right. Sure. Yeah, thanks. So um, if you want to estimate your cost, what you want to do is to use a tool called a net price calculator. Uh, net price calculators are required by law. Every college is required to have one, and it's supposed to show you your estimated total cost, the amount of gift aid that you might receive, and the net price after subtracting gift aid from the total cost. Now, all colleges are required to have a net price calculator, but they are not required to have a good one. And here's how you can tell the difference. If a net price calculator is super easy, it's got maybe five or 10 questions, you can answer it in a few seconds, it probably stinks. If a calculator goes into a lot of detail, it asks a lot of questions, it might be kind of a pain in the neck, but it's probably asking enough questions to give you a more reliable estimate. So um, don't get discouraged because what you're going to find is that net price calculators ask similar types of questions and you're going to find them easier and easier to use as you use more of them. Another thing to keep in mind about net price calculators, especially if you're not a numbers person, is that the output can be confusing or intimidating. If that's the case for you, just go back to the basics and remember, Net price is cost of attendance minus gift aid. Cost of attendance always is tuition and fees, room and board, books and supplies, transportation and other miscellaneous expenses. Subtract from that the total amount of gift aid and the result is your net price for one year of college. So always come back to the fundamentals and you can interpret these net price calculator outputs. Once you check out net price calculators, you want to compare the net price side by side so that you can be looking at an apples to apples comparison in terms of cost. Now here, I want to remind myself to pause because I'm not necessarily advocating that people look for the cheapest possible college. What I am advocating is that you look for a college where you are confident that you can afford the full price of a college degree, and at the end of college, both the parents and the students will be in a good position to move on with the rest of their financial goals. So you do certainly want to make sure that the college offers the classes that your student wants. It's an environment where your student is going to be able to thrive, 
but of course you also want to make sure that it's going to be affordable. So I want to show you an example of uh, net price calculator outputs for a student with an EFC of 15,000 B minus to B grades and an 1100 SAT. At Roger Williams, the starting cost is 58,000. Roger Williams estimates that this student would get a $15,000 a year merit scholarship and additional $3,000 in need-based aid for a net price of about 40,000 a year. At Shenandoah, it's a net price of 36,000. Wheaton in Massachusetts is about 25. SUNY New Pulse is about 23. Bowdoin College is about 15,000 a year. That's great, that's just about equal to the EFC. And at Brooklyn College, commuting and living with your parents, the net price for one year of college is about 11,000. Now, a couple of things to say. First of all, I know that commuting to Brooklyn College is not the same as going away to college and living in a dorm. But the reason I put that example on here is to remind people that there is an affordable path to college for everyone. It may not be the one that you have dreamed about, but far better if there are constraints on what you can pay to college or what you can pay for college to go to one that's affordable for four years and then be in a good position for the student to move on for the next four or five, six decades of life without being burdened with crippling debt. Another thing to keep in mind, Bowdoin's net price looks great, but unfortunately a B minus student is not going to get into Bowdoin. So you also have to factor in the likelihood of admission when you're thinking about these schools. All right, so let's say that you've compared the net price and you wanna think about whether a college is going to be affordable, or maybe you've gotten to the spring and you've gotten some award letters and you wanna think about whether you can afford them. <clears throat> I'm gonna go back to that. Uh, I wanna um, remind you first that uh, gift aid is already included in the net price and getting scholarship aid from sources other than colleges is very rare. So when you get to that net price, you're going to need to be able to pay for that out of income that you earn over time. So what do I mean by that? Well, there are three sources of income. One of them is income that was earned in the past and saved. Another is income that's earned during the college years and you can use to pay for college expenses. And the final source of income is future income, money that's earned after college and is used to repay debt that was taken out to pay for college. So is a net price going to be affordable? I wanna go back to that award letter that we looked at at the beginning of the presentation where we saw that the net price was a little under 35,000. We've got to remember that the cost of a degree is going to be over four years. So we have to ask a couple of questions. One of them is how much are costs going to increase over time? And another very important question is, is the financial aid, the gift aid going to be renewable for each of the four years of college and on what terms? If it is not crystal clear to you whether the aid is renewable and what's required to renew it, be sure to ask the college. Usually, merit aid is renewable as long as the student maintains a minimum GPA in college. Need-based aid is typically renewable as long as the income and assets of the family remain pretty consistent over the course of the college years. But remember, Always make sure you know before you make a commitment to a college what's required to renew aid after the first year. So we're going to assume that costs increase 2% per year, that aid is renewable over the four years, and that the student has $2,000 in savings and the parents have $25,000 in savings. And we're going to see how we can pay for that total cost of a degree. At 35,000 in year one, when you uh, inflated at 2% per year and added up over four years, turns into a $145,000 college degree. 
So let's see how to pay for it. Well, this student was offered $1,800 a year in work study, a campus job during the college year. And we're going to assume that the uh, student takes out federal student loans. If you need to borrow for college, federal student loans are always the first place to look, but there's a maximum amount that you can take out, which is $5,500 in year one, $6,500 in year two, and $7,500 each in years three and four. So that's a maximum of $27,000 over the four years of college. Next, we're gonna look at the student's $2,000 in savings. Remember we said that student assets count more heavily in the EFC formula than parent assets do. So let's use those assets first. Maybe that will increase eligibility for need-based aid in years two, three, and four. After that, we're gonna assume that the student gets a summer job each year before college. So if the student gets a job that pays $10 an hour for 40 hours a week for 10 weeks in the summer, the student's going to earn $4,000. The student's going to pay taxes, have some fun, maybe go to the beach or the movies, but the student should be able to save $2,000 each summer for college expenses. After that, we've used up the student resources and we need to look at the parents. In this case, the parents look at their budget and they say that they can pay $375 a month or $4,500 a year out of their ongoing earnings to use for college expenses while the student's in college. Next, we're gonna use parent savings. And if we use 19,000, we fully paid for year one of college for this student. In the second year, we're gonna use the remaining amount of savings. It's about $6,000. At this point, we have exhausted all of the family's resources, the students and the parents. The only way to pay the additional cost of college is through additional borrowing, which I always consider a parent responsibility because the parent is either going to have to take out those loans in the parent's name or co-sign for the student. So in this example, it's going to take 15,000 of additional borrowing in year two, 21,000 in year three, and 22,000 in year four. So we have fully paid for the four year cost of this degree using prior income, current income, and future income. We end up with student debt of 27,000 and parent debt of 58,000. Is that a good idea? We don't know yet. We don't have enough information to make that uh, judgment. First of all, we've got to know how much loans are going to cost. Well, federal loans for students typically carry about a four and a half percent interest rate. Parent loans carry about a 7% interest rate, and both of them are typically repaid over 10 years, beginning six months after graduation from college. So at that rate and over that 10 year term, that means that for every thousand dollars of student debt, the student is going to need to pay back $125 per year for 10 years. For every thousand dollars of parent debt, the parents are going to need to pay back $140 per year. So in this example, the student has 27,000 in debt 27 times 125 is $3,363 per year that this student will need to pay back. For the parent, 58,000 times 140 is $8,100 a year that the parent is going to need to pay back. So that tells us how much the loans are going to cost. We still don't know if that amount is reasonable. My rule of thumb is that education payments or payments that a student makes for education debt should not exceed about 10% of their gross income. So in this example, with the student taking out $27,000 in debt and having an annual payment of about $3,400 a year, that means that the student needs to get a job right after college that pays $34,000 a year 
That will give the student 90% of their income for taxes, rent, groceries, everything else. I think that that's not an unreasonable trade-off because the average salary for students graduating from college is forty to $50,000 a year. So that $27,000 of debt is probably not a bad deal for the student to take out in order to get the benefit of a college degree. For parents, it's more complicated because they've got to consider their ongoing obligations, college for other children, and their eventual retirement. And in this case, I see a big red flag for these parents. Because remember, when we looked at what they could pay out of income, they said they could pay $375 a month or $4,500 a year. What makes these parents think that if they can only pay $4,500 a year during college, that all of a sudden, after college, they can pay $8,100 a year. This looks to me like a, a bad scenario for this family. And I would conclude that this college for this family is not an affordable choice. So one question that people often ask is, how does everyone else pay? And the answer is exactly the same way we're talking about today. So colleges have a starting cost of attendance. They may award need or merit-based gift aid. You subtract that from the cost of attendance and that equals the net price of college. You then look at the parents or the family resources. So the student will automatically have about $43,000 for college, 27,000 in debt, 8,000 in work study earnings over four years and $8,000 in summer job earnings over four years. You add to that any savings that the parents have available for college and money that the parents can pay out of income during the college years. And those are the resources that are available to pay for college. If there is a gap, the only way to fill that gap is either taking on more debt or finding a lower net price. Now, when I work with families on thinking about how to pay for college, I always want them to think about what I call their zone of affordability. That's the maximum point, price point that they can pay for four years of college. Once they identify that, Colleges that are equal to that price point or lower are within that family's zone of affordability. And I think that a good default zone of affordability is the parent debt free point. The student may take out those 27,000 in student loans, but the parents can finish paying for college without taking on parent debt. That way we can be very confident that both the parents and the students can go on after college and achieve their financial goals, financial and other goals, without being burdened by excessive debt. So when you think about your zone of affordability, there are basically six pots of money available to pay for college. Add five of those six up and excluding the amount of, uh, excluding parent debt from the uh, calculation, that's the parent debt-free point for college. So we've talked about a lot of heavy stuff and college can be a pretty emotional uh, topic in a lot of families. So it's helpful to keep it in perspective. And I find that with a lot of families, they may go through something very similar to the stages of grief. Much better to go through those stages of grief early in the process, very bad to go through them after you've taken out too much debt to pay for college. Another thing is college is important, but it's not the goal. The goal is success after college. And if you think about your own career paths, I'm pretty confident that what you're going to realize is that where people went to college really doesn't play a big role in where people get hired and the jobs they get. What employers want to know about is what you've done in your previous jobs 
and what you're going to do for this employer. Another thing to keep in mind is that some pretty successful people did not go to elite expensive colleges. Howard Schultz, the guy behind Starbucks, went to Northern Michigan University. Bob Iger, the longtime uh, CEO of the Walt Disney Company, went to Ithaca College. And Michelle Buck, the current CEO of Hershey Chocolate, Hershey Foods, went to Shippensburg University in Pennsylvania. All fine colleges, but none of them those expensive brand name colleges that you might think of top of mind. Another thing is a lot of people think going to an expensive college is going to pay off in dollars and cents. Looking at the mid-career earnings of graduates of Colorado College, Connecticut College, and Allegheny College, those earnings differ by about $1,000. They're almost exactly the same. But the difference in the four-year net price is over $100,000. <coughs> so you might pay $100,000 to gain the benefit of a very small increment in earnings potential. So if you want to find financial safeties, you can go through a process similar to what I've described today, using the numbers, using tables and charts to uh, figure out your student's profile and which colleges are likely to award aid given your student's profile. Another kind of shortcut way is to seed your list with colleges that have different approaches to the way they award aid. And if you do that, it's likely that you'll end up with some affordable schools on your student's list. So for uh, New York residents, including a SUNY, always makes sense. Uh, you might think about an out-of-state public flagship. Take a look at the difference in cost and for an out-of-state secondary public. So Worcester State starts at 32,000 a year compared to UMass at 52,000 a year. If your student has high need, some of the very highly selective private colleges may be a good match. And if your student needs merit aid, the uh, website for the colleges that change lives gives a list of a number of kind of under the radar, very good small colleges, and many of them tend to award a lot of merit aid. And don't forget, there's that affordable path to college for everyone. And for some people, that means going to Brooklyn College or Queens College to uh, make sure that you don't take on excessive debt. So uh, thanks a lot to everyone who has joined the call. I have a website here and I've got some uh, resources that you're free to take a look at. And then if anyone would like a copy of the slides, please send me an email and I'll be happy to email them to you. And I appreciate your attention and, and uh, uh, bearing with me for uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, at this point, I think we've got some time for questions. So uh, if, uh, if there are some questions uh, in the chat, why don't you uh, let me know and we'll try to answer them. Uh, sure. Uh, Chris, can you um, monitor the chat for questions, please? Uh, yes. Thank um, you. So there's a one question is uh, do a parent is a retirement account such as 401k or an IRA impact financial aid? So that's a great question. And the answer is no. Uh, money that is in qualified retirement accounts such as an IRA or a 401k are not counted as assets in the EFC formula. Okay, the, um, then an, uh, a attendant is uh, named what? Galaxy S58 uh, has raised a hand for a long time. And uh, could, you, um, could you speak up, unmute yourself and uh, speak up? What's your question, please? Chat, chat. Galaxy S8 Plus. Here, here, here. Time message. Is your home counted as an asset? Is your primary? I have a question. Will the recording of this meeting be provided to the parents? 
Yes, our copy of the recording will be um, placed on the website, the YouTube Thank website. You. Got it. Take the picture. So I hear a question, I think, Anna about uh, home equity. Is that correct? Uh, let me let me answer that because that comes up quite a bit. So home equity is not counted as an asset for the FAFSA, but it is counted as an asset for most profile colleges. So um, it's treated a little bit differently in the FAFSA formula than the uh, formula for the CSS profile. It is counted at CSS profile colleges for the most part. Sometimes they will put a cap on the amount of home equity, which has the effect of reducing its impact on the EFC. But that's not universal. That's done on a college by college uh, basis. So uh, I hope that that gives a, a bit of an answer to that. I see uh -huh. another question about, um, I, it, it says, I use an example of showing SAT-based aid for merit aid. Has anything changed since the SAT has become optional? So that's a great question. Um, and uh, colleges, so the SAT has become op optional at most colleges as a result of the difficulty that people have had during the pandemic of taking uh, the SAT test. And um, I think it's quite likely that many colleges will continue to be SAT optional even as the pandemic wanes. Colleges that use merit aid are continuing to use merit aid even if SAT scores are not available. So even if your student does not have SAT scores or ACT scores, they still are likely to be uh, a good candidate for merit aid as long as they're strong relative to the college's other applicants. It makes it a little bit more difficult to accurately predict exactly how much merit aid you might get. But the bottom line is that even at colleges, even if you do not report test scores, it's quite likely that your student can still be a good candidate for merit aid. Okay, next question is, does money in the TDA account count as asset? Uh, I'm not sure what you're meaning by TDA. So if you could clarify what you mean by that acronym. acronym. Yeah, um, TDA is, is a account used by either nurses or if you're part of New York City, Employment. I think that's what the, this person means by TDA, and it's for the, it's used for retirement. So, based on your question, that retirement account is not used. It's possible the TDA would not be used as you know, yes. towards your account, towards your um, income. I I expect that that's correct. I expect that a, if a TDA account is a tax deferred retirement account, it would not be included as an asset. So uh, will an adult sibling's assets count against the student's uh, CSS profile? So this is a good question. So if, so the CSS profile asks for the amount of assets in the student's sibling's names. And when they do that, they are referring to siblings who are current dependents on the parents. So uh, if, a sibling is a dependent of the parent and has assets in that sibling's name, those do count on the CSS profile. If a sibling is an adult and independent and no longer part of the parent's households, that sibling's assets would not count for the CSS profile. So is there a limit on financial aid based on income? I noticed that a few net price calculators are capped at 99,999. Um, so there is not strictly speaking a limit on uh, need-based aid based on income, but 
higher income generally is highly associated with higher EFCs. So higher income often does mean that there will be little or no eligibility for need-based aid. On the other hand, merit-based aid is independent of income. So even if income is quite high, uh, the student may well get merit aid. Uh, Bill, I got a question. Um, someone just sent me this email. If you have a if you have one child that has a disability and uh, is the, is completely dependent on the parent, and the parent's income is large in you know, a large because of you know the child that's in you know dependent, and one is going to college, how would that impact the financial aid received by the student that's going to college? So that's one of those special cases where um, if if a parent is caring for a disabled child, the parent may well have unusually high expenses. And those are not captured automatically by the FAFSA in the profile. So that's a case where the parent would want to reach out to the colleges that the uh, student is applying to, explain the specific circumstances and hopefully be in a position to document the dollars and cents involved to the college. And that could result in increased eligibility for aid. Thank you. Next question is, uh, do inherited IRAs account as a child's asset? Um, no. So an inherited IRA is, is also not included as a child's or as an asset. Um, most inherited or many inherited IRAs may require that a portion be distributed as income each year. So the income that comes out of an IRA would be reported as income, but um, the amount of the IRA remaining as an asset would not be included as an asset. Thank you. Uh, next one is if an NPC doesn't, task about, uh, doesn't ask about GPA or SAT, does it mean the college does not offer merit aid? So that's a great question. And the answer is no. Many colleges that do not include GPA or SAT questions on their calculators do offer merit aid. Now, obviously, if they're not asking questions about it on their calculator, you probably are not going to get a good estimate of what the merit aid might be. So it's add some uncertainty if you're trying to estimate your costs of college, but it does not necessarily mean that the college doesn't use merit aid when your student actually gets a financial aid offer. So for example, Northeastern does use in, in Boston, does not ask about SAT or GPA on its net price calculator, but they do use some merit aid when they're awarding aid. Okay, um, next question is, uh, uh, how many years of tax returns from the parents are required for the first year college enrollment? Yeah, so in most cases, that's just going to be one single year. So for a student who's a junior and going to be going to college in 2023, it would just be the tax return for 2021 when the student becomes a sophomore, then they'll ask for the tax return for 2022. Now the profile does ask about prior year and expected subsequent year income, but they rarely require tax returns for those years unless there are some unusual circumstances that might make them uh, question it. So, um, so the answer is typically only one year, although there could be rare exceptions. Thank you. Um, next one is uh, from, uh, from Perrin Vincent, and he has a, a, a hand raised. And also his question is, does assets in a trust in their parents' name, such as a, a, a real estate, rental income, stocks, 
and as such accounts towards estimated for aid? Yes, um, yes they do. Um, and a trust can be disadvantageous when planning for financial aid because many trusts are set up such that the parents or the students may not have access to the assets in a trust. And even so, they're going to be counted as a resource for financial aid. So um, trusts can be uh, a double-edged sword when planning for college. But the bottom line is that assets in a trust do count uh, toward the ESC. Uh, I got another email. Uh, um, another parent, um, I think this is Charles, is asking, even though the trust, uh, okay, even though the trust is, is, is not in the parent name, but in the name of uh, a, dis, um, a disabled child, would that also be counted against the parent? Uh, so that's, so that's a good question. So um, usually trusts are counted as I described, but a trust that has been specifically set aside for medical expenses uh, could be exempt. And again, this is one of those special circumstances where talking with each college that the student is applying to is, is really going to be important to make sure that you know how to report these things and how to get the maximum amount of aid. Okay, I sent that email to him. Okay, thank you, Bill. And uh, the next one is a how are 529s set up by other family member, by the way, not the parents, gets counted in the EFC equation. Okay, so 529s can have a lot of complications, or uh, so it's important to remember how they work. 529s are accounts that are set up to help pay for education, and if they are used um, for education, the amount of earnings in the 529 can be exempt from taxes. 529s have an owner and a beneficiary. How the 529s are treated depends on who is the owner. So if the 529 is owned by the parent and the student is a beneficiary, it's reported as a parent asset. If the 529 is owned by the student and the student is the beneficiary, it falls under that special loophole exception that I described and is reported as a parent asset. If a 529 is set up and owned by a family member other than the parent or the student, for example, a grandparent, then it is not counted as an asset in the EFC formula. However, when distributions from that 529 are made, those distributions count as income. And so that's a case where planning the timing of those distributions to take place after the students, uh, after January 1st of the student's sophomore year of college can uh, make a difference. Now, remember this only applies if the student is eligible, is receiving need-based aid the student is not receiving need-based aid, then it's not really a factor. Okay, thank you, Bill. And next one is how does outstanding mortgage affect EFC? So all assets that are reported for the EFC are reported uh, in this way. You look at the market value of the asset, and you subtract from it the amount of debt that is secured by that asset. So in this question, they're talking about real estate. So you would look at the value of the real estate, subtract the amount of mortgage debt and report the equity amount as the asset value. I guess that's the end of the question list. Anybody has more questions? 